wait for that to kick in, uh, admitting some other people. Here we go, they're all coming in now. Okay, I'm, I'm just waiting for the record light to come on and then we'll kick off. There we go. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Angular Sussex Meetup. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about refactoring. Okay. And um, if I may, I think I'm probably going to kick off. So I'm just going to get my notes ready and I'm going to move this tab over to here. That's better. Right. Good. I can see you all over there. Right. And now I'm going to um, click that, that thing there and then I'm going to start sharing a screen. Here we go. There we go. Oh, I'm tell you what, I'm going to escape out of that one. I'm going to go back to the right point. Here we are. Now, hopefully, yep, I reckon you can probably see my screen now, can't you? My presentation. So a few yeah. nods there. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so um, do you refactor? Um, I, I do. Well, sometimes and probably not as much as I would like. Um, but uh, tonight we're going to sort of have a bit of a discussion. I'm, I'm going to sort of run through a few of my ideas and let people in at the same time. There we go. Um, uh, yeah, run through a few of my ideas, but um, there'll be several gaps during which you can sort of insert your ideas as well, because this is a discussion and I'd like to sort of come to a consensus rather than, you know, dare I dictate. Good grief. No. Right. This This is just an opinion. Right, so um, I'm, I'm going to start by showing what, what I'm planning to talk about. And here we go. So uh, first, I'm going to run through some definitions to make sure we're all on the same page. And then I'm going to talk about how to persuade your project manager. Um, I, I don't know if you get troubles, but I've had project managers who are hard to persuade. And that's why I think it's worth talking about. And then um, after that, is what to refactor first and refactor targets. So hopefully we can have a discussion about what you think should come first or your priority list and um, in, in code terms, what that means. And then finally, uh, I'd like to talk about renaming Angular components, which is a bit of a bugbear for me. And I, I'd really like to share my ideas with you and maybe hear from you too. OK, so let's get going. Um, first of all, so um, some of this is going to be very obvious, but I just want to make sure we're all in, in the same area. OK, a project manager is a person who organizes your tasks. But if you're in a team of one, then that could be you. But that's great news because persuading your project manager is going to be really easy. It's you. Um, however, um, a project manager if they're on your team, um, it is someone who's not necessarily technical, who organizes your tickets on some, uh, project management systems such as JIRA, and um, you need to persuade them to have time for refactor, or at least I hope you do. Okay, I'm just gonna admit somebody, there we are, good. Um, the, the next uh, sort of keyword we need to talk about is a stakeholder. Now that could include a project manager, but it's anyone who stands to gain from the success of your project, or indeed who stands to uh, lose from, from, from the failure of it, okay? So they're, they're the people you need to persuade. So, by refactor, what do we mean? Well, leaving code in, uh, you know, structured in a way that only you can understand is tech debt. This probably, is the first reason for needing refactor so that we can simplify our code and make it more maintainable. After development, refactoring is much more difficult to get permission for. Whoops, 
I'll, I'll try and keep on the same page. There we are. Um, uh, which, which is uh, why I tend to say it needs uh, doing in order to uh, fix a feature. Uh, this is usually justified by, by saying that patching spaghetti uh, frequently ends up taking longer. Uh, but we'll come to that. So, how do you persuade your project manager? Um, the main point I'd like to talk about is the fact that you need to sell uh, the idea of, of a refactor. Um, let, let some latecomers in. There we go. Um, and uh, selling involves, to me, the, these, these few points or strategies that I approach. Okay, here we go. Um, I, I better click the right part. Come on, where's my mouse gone? There we are. So, um, the first one is uh, asserting your experience. And I'm putting in brackets that the bar is low. Uh, as I mentioned before, that your project manager is usually not that technical or maybe uh, has previously been a developer, but is, has doesn't have that much current experience. So by uh, letting your project manager or stakeholders know uh, that you are an experienced Angular developer, which I, I, I'm getting a feel that most of us are, and hopefully all of us will be very shortly, um, is it, if, you, if you say that you, you know, you, your Angular application needs this refactor so as to either improve performance or more importantly, fix bugs, right? Then you're more likely to win them over. The other tactic I use is to quantify the benefits um, and I'll list them out, I, but I'll choose the benefits, not that I see as a developer, but the ones that I know I can sell to the project manager that they will see as, as um, a, a valuable benefit. Usually it's all about saving time. So if it's going to save time for their project deadline, if that's MVP, then so be it. Then um, uh, that, that's the sort of benefit that I'll list for them. Um, at the same time, I, I try to spend time accurately estimating how long things will take. Um, uh, an interesting or useful rule that I was given by, by a developer many, 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 many years ago um, was that w when you're trying to estimate for a stakeholder, because it's in your interest to try and shave it down and give them a, a reasonably tight estimate. For safety, you actually need to double what your estimate is. So take your, your worst estimate, okay, your worst outside time and then double it, um, which is a bit sort of outrageous, but I find that it means that it never lands you in trouble because you won't overrun. Um, if you find that your, your uh, coming in much earlier than that, then good luck to you. But I found that in my early days as a developer, that pretty much uh, was spot on for the, for the time that I actually took. Um, just simply because you're always trying to, to uh, get their things developed quickly and therefore you underestimate the time that a refactor on code that you don't know very well um, will take. Okay. Next point, selling refactoring to stakeholders. Um, yeah, well, basically, uh, it's, it is what it, it says. Um, if you've got a refactor that you've done before, you can point to it and say, hey, guys, look, I did this and it solved this problems. And I want to now do this next refactor that's very similar. I'm going to do the same kind of work and it's going to solve X. Um, and this will usually get get your refactor through if it's not going to take too long. And then finally, there's the going covert method. That's that's usually when um, uh, when your stakeholders are sort of conspiring to reach MVP and they don't particularly mind accruing tech debt. Um, they're, they're not very interested in a, in a refactor, but if you know that you're going to have a problem delivering that MVP, um, then maybe it's time to inflate your individual tickets so that you can squeeze in some refactor time, sort of piecemeal, and, and get it under the under the radar. 
Um, the one thing I would mention, and it's in brackets here, provided your project requires quality. So before you, you go covert, remember this lesson I, I learned recently, um, that sometimes the, the, excuse me, the senior um, stakeholders don't actually necessarily want quality. They just want to deliver. And um, if that's the case, then you shouldn't be inflating your tickets. So it's it, you kind of, but when it comes to these soft skills, you've got to figure out what the seniors really, really want um, and not try to um, make, make things high quality just because you want them that way or, or because it hurts your eyes, um, which, which um, bad code often uh, does to me. Right, okay, so moving on, there, there's an admission. Right, uh, moving on, here we go. So, what to refactor first? Well, um, I'm kind of approaching this in a, in a soft way first, and then we'll do the technicals, okay? But um, what, what I refactor is the piece, the feature that will fix the most bugs. So I, I target the, the, the biggest ticket on the board that, that actually relates to several uh, other bugs um, w within the sort of the, the longer term, if, if you are sort of scouring JIRA. Um, and you can sort of group those together. And, and not only is it good for selling to your project manager, but it also gets you that win, you know, uh, the bit about selling refactors uh, to stakeholders through results. So if you can get your biggest result in first, then the others come easy. And uh, then when I get permission to do it, or when I've actually factored it into the time for the ticket estimate, then I, I do it in small PRs to reduce impact. Okay, there's a reason for this. Okay, and that is that um, when, when uh, you unplug everything and then rewire it, you can frequently uh, find that there's some sub feature or sub uh, business rules uh, that, that uh, open a whole new can of worms that you didn't estimate for, um, which is why I say try to make the smallest changes or take it in chunks so that you can reduce impact and most importantly, not get caught um, by the end of your ticket estimate without having solved enough problems. So that's why I reduce it in, and um, into small PRs. The other one I do is try to make that decision uh, in uh, and based on an estimate in the midterm, uh, whether to do an edit or a rewrite. Um, I believe this is um, close to uh, Rob, um, Agent RR's um, a heart, and, and I'd really like to talk about that a bit further, um, and I hope to draw him into the conversation shortly. Okay, let's uh, move on. So uh, I'll click the right button again. There we go. So refactor targets. So um, I, here's, here's a few items that I tend to go for. But you'll find that the topmost one is actually a link to an article that, that I use as, as sort of a, a, a sort of a guide from a holistic point of view. And then I try and sort of refine it into a feature area um, so that I can do it sort of uh, like, like big ticket by big ticket, as, as I've mentioned before. Um, but however, let's talk about it. So how to refactor an Angular code base. Um, it's an article on indepth.com uh, or in, indepth.dev, sorry. It's written by a chap called Armin Vardanyan. I hope I pronounced that right because he's in the house tonight. Okay. And um, I'm wondering if you fancy taking over for the presentation and talk through your document there. Yeah, um, sure. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me today. So, uh, refactoring for me is a big topic uh, because I spend most of my life uh, in development refactoring stuff. So I will go ahead and start presenting. Uh, let me just, uh, sorry. 
Yeah. I uh, also I have uh, cloned one uh, example repository of mine. It's a real application on which I will show how some parts of that refactoring work. Uh, so some points in my article, uh, Tom has already mentioned them. Uh, of course, it's talking to management or maybe if you are working on an outsourced project, maybe to the client directly and trying to kind of uh, sell your idea for refactoring. Why do you need that? Um, it's It will be, of course, better if you can visually uh, kind of uh, show how that will, maybe it will improve performance, maybe it will improve development time. You really want to emphasize that, like, if you uh, have this refactoring, the code will be so easier to maintain, means meaning in the future we can expand the code base without too much problems. Uh, and actually, I, I found it uh, useful in, in that situation, kind of not to be afraid to get a bit technical, just if you can kind of explain in more simple terms, like how this refactoring will help uh, <clears throat> make uh, the whole thing more maintainable, why is it important, why it might uh, improve performance or something, something. So uh, this is the part to where you were before starting it. So you can also try to do some experiments before beginning, because sometimes we have these big ideas about how oh, I will change this whole like architectural part of how everything works in the core of the application and it will work and it will be fine. But in reality, it's not a good look. So maybe before going directly to doing it, or maybe even talking to management or something, you may try opening another branch and uh, doing some lifting there. And if it works, if you really see like you have a small like sort of proof of concept, then you can surely go ahead and say, you know, this is this is a good thing. I tried it, so we really need to implement it completely. The refactoring thing. Uh, so, of course, then we would should have target uh, uh, specific areas that we want to refactor. Most of the applications that we have uh, really uh, have things that could like be written better. Even if it's a really clean application, if it's really good, main, well maintained, if it's really a nice thing, it still probably has some areas that can be improved. So, if we have the time, if there is a period that you know don't have too many pressing deadlines, you sure can look around and find things that are even slightly irritating with the thing that uh, it will improve the maintainability of the application. So uh, <clears throat> so I usually go on and start with uh, performance. So if there is something that can improve performance, that is definitely something that you can sell to management and that you can push. Uh, like there is a real benefit to doing that. And I usually start with lazy loading. If I have a large application, uh, and of course this is a very like a stereotypical thing that appears in almost all, all articles, like everyone is saying, oh, you, you need to have lazy loading, so you maybe uh, have this misconception that, oh, you know, oh, you know, in 2022, right, everyone has lazy loading in application, but the reality is that uh, there are either situations that some modules can be lazy loaded but are not, or maybe lazy loading isn't used at all. So the very first thing that I usually take a look if I can refactor a new, for me, code base is, uh, can I add lazy loading? Maybe, maybe it doesn't have lazy loading. So usually uh, it provides very obvious benefits like re reduction in bundle size, uh, better performance. Also, when you start sorting all those things out, the architecture may improve. Uh, you may realize that something is in a module that it doesn't really belong to. And now that's lazy loading, you move it somewhere up uh, the module tree or something. Uh, so, of course, it may also mean uh, more major refactoring, but usually don't, not many bugs and issues arise from introducing lazy loading. If we have nice architecture, usually it just means doing changes to the router module, and then it will be uh, easier after that. We'll just say, oh yeah, the bundle size is improved. Uh, lazy loading is great. Now we can go forward with that. So the very first thing I focus is on lazy loading. If I cannot lazy loading, I start with that. Uh, next thing that usually lots of applications can benefit is updating the Angular to latest version. 
uh, I try to keep my applications of work uh, updated uh, and even with all, all that effort that I pull into that I'm usually like two three months behind uh, our application has version 12 uh, and you know it's uh, the latest version is 13 so I, I have an update on my hands and uh, there are very many applications out there that still use even pre-IV versions so uh, updating uh, an angular version if you don't have very many other dependencies is usually an easy task you go to update.angular.io and follow instructions and usually run commands so so this is a straightforward thing uh, it may provide better performance for example if you go from version 7 to version 9 plus you will get uh, better bundle sizes usually with IV and maybe better uh, rendering speeds or something depending on how you have written your components uh, and also uh, you, you sometimes you get new nice features and maybe some chunks of code become obsolete so I, so I usually do this like first or second if, the, if I can update the version because sometimes uh, some parts of the code become obsolete and you can remove them with the newer version uh, so you won't need to refactor that parts of the code so it's a nice thing so if you can deal with the problem with an update that should go for the update and it, the problem solved uh, of course there are more problems with updating than with like introducing lazy loading because uh, usually we have other dependencies that work with angular I had a very major problem when I updated from angular 10 to 11 because it required uh, to update uh, prime ng we we're using prime ng as a UI components library and we got so angular 10 to 11 no breaking changes like almost no changes at all but having to update prime ng there are huge breaking changes in in styling in the component names and everything so it took like three to four days to fix all of that mess so usually it kind of depends on uh, the structure of your app it's a simpler app if you like use angular and some small dependencies that aren't really related to angular sure go for it but be uh, sure if you have other dependencies that you might have, may, might have problems uh, if we go further back, there were some problems when we were upgrading our, our XGS versions to pipe uh, methods and operators and everything. So uh, surely this is a, a, a riskier step to take. But I guess it's like the second one in in the size of the work that needs to be done throughout the application, right? Uh, next, I do my probably second favorite thing. Uh, fixing the folder structure so so this is a very uh, big uh, illness with lots of angular code bases uh, like you can have very clean code your code may be great like you use good patterns and everything and it's nice and shiny but but you have a bad folder structure and it becomes problematic when when you are adding files when you're adding new files and now you have if it's a large like enterprise application for example we are developing an app that has like around 8000 files so it's a mess in terms of like finding anything uh, locating where something may be uh, present maybe there is a service that you can use maybe there isn't one uh, so if you have a bad structure it would be really hard to find stuff it would really hard to reason about and it will be very difficult to explain the project to newcomers and this is a very important thing because software development is very dynamic usually during one year someone will leave your team and someone will join your team so someone with a great experience with your project may leave and then a uh, new person comes they are a great developer, but they don't know your application. You now need to explain how everything works, what approaches you have. And if you are not consistent with your code base, then you have got a problem here. Uh, sorry, I have an issue with my mouse here. So 
what I usually do, I start with uh, looking uh, in general of how everything is structured. If I have uh, different uh, features, uh, we usually have uh, some features that are relevant to Angular, like components, pipes, uh, directives, services, and everything. Um, and inside those types of features, we have uh, like logical related to the business logic features. For example, we might have uh, something like uh, services related to some entity and maybe uh, some components related to that entity and so on. So it's very important to try to group them in a logical way. So what I usually do is uh, what is advised in the Angular uh, official style guide. So here we have like group by feature rather than type. What does that mean is that we don't group, we don't have a folder with services, right? We have, uh, or we don't have a folder that says like directives and all the directives go there or something like that. And we definitely don't have a, a folder called components with all the components in it because we have different components. We have some components that we have are like pages in that are routed that the user can visit, but some components are uh, parts of those pages. Like we separate the page in, into like three components. So they definitely belong with the component that they are used inside because we usually edit them together. The, the logic behind that is that the files that are edited together should be as close as possible. If I have a feature that deals for with users, for example, I have a list of users, I have a user details or something, uh, pages like that, so they belong together. Of course, Angular helps us with the CLI. CLI generates component code together, like an HTML file, a CSS file, a TS file, and they usually put it together because that is the general approach. Uh, we have those things together. Uh, also, uh, I usually go with storing one entity, be it a class, component, uh, interface, or something, something in a single file. So I don't have a, a file that has several classes in it. Uh, it will uh, it will hinder me if I try to look for some of those classes. If I know that there might be something called, for example, uh, book model that is used somewhere, I guess because this is an application that represents a library, so I guess maybe there is a book model. And I try to look for it, but there isn't a file that is called book model uh, because there is a file called, for example, article model, but you uh, put stuff uh, that doesn't belong to that there. Uh, so I uh, see a question in, in the chat about uh, sort of uh, synchronizing stuff with uh, the backhand. Uh, and I believe I believe there is it's a valid question and it's a valid approach, but we uh... do you mind if I chime in? Yeah, sure. Okay, so um... There, there, there's there's two kinds of harmonizing, I think, okay? Um, I've come across uh, some unhealthy harmonizing before. Um, so so if you think of um, API services as, as um, uh, uh, micro uh, services, often the concerns of and the logic of that API and, and that sort of uh, domain or bounded context is specific to that API. Whereas if you think about a journey or a feature area of an application that usually straddles several uh, API bounded contexts and sometimes uh, straddles uh, microservices. And so therefore um, harmonizing structure in terms of keeping everything naming convention and, and everything compartmentalized for that actually creates work. Um, so it's it's a judgment call. You kind of got to group those things that are logically a feature within the application, but try to use the next same similar naming convention that's within the, the, the APIs. That That's my opinion. Armin, over to you. 
Uh, yeah, it's an uh, it's generally uh, the approach that I also take. Uh, for me, most of the issues coming with trying to synchronize the backend is trying to fit everything into one model. So a very popular problem that we have, and I think lots of code bases suffer from that, is that you have this model that comes from the backend, then there is a feature, then a user can edit that and send it back. But somehow something is different between the model that you receive and the model that you need to send. And also there may be a problem that, for example, some of your components, third-party components, accept data that is slightly different from what you receive from the backend, and you have no power over the backend. You cannot say, oh, API, please send me some other form of this data. So you need to kind of change that. Uh, so I have approaches that uh, use uh, state management and approaches that don't use state management. But usually, we, <clears throat> but usually we have like two models for that. I see. D Danny has uh, yeah. raised a hand. Do you fancy interjecting there? Uh, yeah, I just I just want to elaborate a little bit on the question because we actually went from having a, a back-end developers and front-end developers to all being full-stack developers because we're optimizing the back-end uh, very much. So that's why I asked the question because there we really saw it makes sense to harmonize the back-end and the front-end because it's a lot easier to rationalize about when we, when we try to figure out what is connected where. But I do see the point that it doesn't make sense if you have like a complete REST API or something like that, then you might mess up the front end trying to make it sort of look the same. I, I think you're spot on, Danny. And I, I think particularly if you guys have adopted the concept of um, back end for front end uh, style, you know, as in a, a pattern that, that reduces work on, on the front end, then it's likely that your APIs will represent the same sort of models that will be in the front end. Yep. Thanks. I usually, yeah, I usually go with uh, trying to kind of, in our application, we usually rely on NGRX a lot. So we utilize selectors for that. If, if, the, if some sort of data is too complex for the API to provide in one go, so we have microservices, so they work independently. So it's easier to make two HTTP calls get some data and I need to combine that. I just use selectors to make more complex selectors uh, so that I don't need to write any models for that because type inference works and everything works. So I just uh, kind of use that data without having to provide. I just provide the same models that the backend gives me so that I have typing and then I don't do anything with that at all. I just combine the data, use it somehow. Um, so Another uh, thing that is important for me here in this part is the naming of our files and folders. Uh, it's actually a big topic because uh, we usually don't give, we, we give lots of thoughts to the names of our classes, to the names of our variables, because we want them to, to understand what is stored in them and everything. But we sometimes don't give too much thought to how we structure the naming of our files and folders. So what they usually like to do is go around rename folders so that they are more explicit. For example, and I will show how it works for me, I mentioned both the type and the feature. This is also from the official Angular style guide, but I noticed that lots of people forgo this in the sense that, oh, you know, I have just one file named like this. Uh, why would it be a problem at all? So for example, if I have a feature called bookmarks and I have a bookmarks service, and I have a, I don't know, bookmarks component. I mentioned that it's a bookmark service and it's a bookmarks component and it's a bookmark directive, whatever. Uh, even if it is located in a related folder, like if I have a folder called services inside the bookmarks feature, I will still call that file bookmark service.ts. Why is that? Because if I use something like VS Code and I, try to locate a file. So if I look for bookmarks here, I will see that I have lots of files that are named bookmarks, like reducer, effects, adapter, actions, entity, and so on and so on. I could forego this. I could say that, you know, in the bookmarks folder here, I have something, something. 
and in the component, uh, and I have a separate uh, folder called state that groups everything here for NGRX. Uh, so I might think if I have a bookmark folder, then let's just call it actions TS because it's understandable that it's the bookmarks actions, right? Because it's in this folder. But if I go looking for actions TS, I will see that I have like lots of actions TS here. And I will have to navigate and still find it. And it will get very frustrating. But if I'm looking for bookmarks action, I just like this and oh, boom, here it goes. It is the first one, bookmarks action and so on. Uh, so longer file and folder name are not problematic at all. We actually want to be very explicit, it's easier to find easier to find uh, features, components, and everything if we have good names that are, that are explicit. Uh, it might seem like a small thing, but if you are taking lots of time to locate stuff, even if you know where it is, it gets irritating fast. And you try to reduce like stress while developing. We usually try to reduce boilerplate, we try to reduce like finding stuff. Uh, imagine trying to find something in a file without control F. That's something like the same, but for the folder structure. If you have like 10 files with the same name, you will have to look at the whole folder path to understand which one you need. And if you don't know which one it is, that it will be even more problematic if you're new to the project. It, this might take a while, yeah, as my article says. So if you have lots of files and folders, you will have to juggle them around, find the specific places. But it's, it's usually not a dangerous process. The worst case scenario is you move something and forget to update the imports if your ID doesn't do that automatically for you. Even if it's the case, you will get build errors. So you, you must probably will not have like runtime bugs doing renamings of folders and files. So it's more or less a safe process. It's just time consuming. Next, what I like to do is reshaping model structure. So I usually have uh, dependencies in app module. Uh, so I move some of the dependencies that are related to the entire application to another module called core module. This is a standard approach. So like if I have like internationalization, translations, I don't know, NGRX or other state management, it, it's universal for the application. It doesn't matter the module. So it goes to the core module that is then imported in the app module. Everything commonly used that might be relevant is like shared components. It might be relevant to free modules, but not others. They go to a shared module. Uh, and sometimes if I have large feature modules inside, I will have a shared module for that module if, if it's a large thing. Uh, but that usually comes for one or two modules in a big code base. So it's, it's, it's kind of reaching to assume that you have that. And then, of course, uh, there is the style guide that will have help with that. Um, it will take even more time to implement maybe than renaming like folders. Uh, it also may result in bugs because sometimes Angular is not very explicit that you have a problem with uh, a module in part. So this may like um, take uh, the uh, approach. If we want to do this, then we might expect some runtime bugs, maybe some mysterious bugs that uh, are hard to solve. So um, start using Linter. If you don't uh, know Angular, move to ESLint. So this also may take time to introduce but this is instant improvement to code quality so you see lots of problems you can fix them automatically some will remain they they it's kind of time consuming a bit but it's a very uh, very instant improvement to like your code base and code quality uh, and now up comes the most favorite part of refactoring for me as using ArcGIS, improving how we work with observables. Uh, now this is already the level of when we come down to the code itself, we move past like architecture and folders and everything now we're working with the code. So I usually leave this in the end of refactoring process because um, 
everything else is like more universal and this is more targeted approach. Like yeah, this, here I have a component, it is nice, I don't have to do anything with it, but oh, here is another component, there are problems in it, I'm gonna target that. Usually lots of problems come with abusing RxJS and uh, I usually three steps that I recommend to do is, well, first of all, start using more operators. You can fix lots of problems uh, with using relevant operators. Uh, just take a look at subscribe statements. Maybe there is some logic that can really, really be um, moved to an operator. Like if there's an if statement uh, that only executes code in some case that maybe you can just use a filter operator for that. Uh, I have articles on that. I mentioned that those here, so you can also refer to those and see how you can improve our GS code. Uh, take a look at subscriptions that you have most probably in like 90% of the case, you don't need to subscribe to observables. You just have to use the async pipe. Even if you have to do side effects, you can use the tap operator and still then use the async pipe. It's an improvement because you don't have to write anything like in the engine it method. It can be like uh, clean and empty. And uh, you can uh, also, you don't have to unsubscribe manually because async pipe does that. So it's also a very instant improvement. Like, oh yes, yeah, I, I subscribe to you. I don't really need, I, I, subscribing to an observable just to extract the value, put it in another uh, property to display it in the HTML. You don't need that. You can just use the async pipe and you won't have to unsubscribe and everything. Uh, and then comes the most, as I said, challenging part, the converting uh, imperative logic, um, because there are situations when you have this big chunk of logic and you really don't see how you can kind of implement it just with observables, just with the async pipe. So, uh, but there are really very many situations where you can do that. You can uh, change the logic. So I have also an article about that. I refer to that. I won't dive into that too much. Um, so benefits. Can you give us a sample of the article? Can you give us a link? I'm sorry. Yeah, I will. Uh, I will put it in, in the chat here. Uh, they are referenced in the main articles uh, here. Here, we can also just uh, go over uh, the article, see the links in the relevant sections. But I will post the links shortly. Um, the good thing here is it's easy to achieve in the sense that you can just go step by step. Like you see one component has a problem, you open a ticket, open a branch, work on it. Uh, if there are bugs, they're definitely related to just that piece of code. So you don't, it's, it's not a headache. You might think a lot, but it's not a headache. <laughs> so uh, you can do it step by step. And it really provides a very large improvement to code quality because most of the problems are from abusing RGS. Also, if you're using NGRX or other state management system, they also rely on observables usually. Uh, so there is even more potential to abuse them. So if you go over all that stuff and you will see that the code quality improves. And also uh, as a bonus, uh, expression changed after it has been checked errors might go away, some of them at least. But most of them are related to um, stuff like, yeah, Tom. Hi, yeah, it's it's funny. I I accidentally triggered one of those myself just recently. Okay, um, yeah. yeah so using async pipe bypasses anything that you bother to go and set into uh, ng after view in it, uh, which is the key one to to actually trigger that error. <laughs> Um, so if, if you turn things into an observable, um, then, then, then um, that goes away because it becomes asynchronous and happens on the next tick, which is exactly what you need. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's, uh, it also kind of reduces the mental load uh, in the components. You don't need to track where the data goes. You have a property that is an observable it cannot be mutated in any way. That's uh, sometimes there are issues, bugs arise from a situation where you subscribe to an observable, you put a value in another property, but somehow it doesn't work. Then you go around the component code, which may be huge, and then find somewhere, oh, this method like mistakenly changes this property imperatively. 
and you had to like go around and find what and then you change that and it turns out that it was actually achieving something it wasn't just put there by mistake there is like like 80 percent of situations like that usually the developer didn't do that by mistake but there was a better approach that they couldn't have written any of that code so that that bug wouldn't even uh, like arise at all. So yeah, definitely switching to more observables, more states uh, from a single source is uh, is generally a good approach. Uh, so those are main points. Some other things that you can do to improve, of course, just going for individual components, um, maybe spotting things that you don't like. Uh, remember, refactoring doesn't need to always follow the same rules. Uh, sometimes you may have internal conventions in your team that uh, don't necessarily agree with, for example, the official style guide, or maybe don't agree with all what I write in my articles. My articles are like 50% opinionated. Some advice is good, some advice is my opinion. I like it that way, but you might like it different. What is important is like keeping conventions and being consistent in your code base. So sometimes your team agrees on doing this thing, but you find a component that does another thing, you just go on refactor. It's usually an easy thing to do. Um, using more functional code uh, versus like imperative approaches. Uh, also using HTTP interceptors. I noticed that sometimes people go on around extending uh, or creating wrappers around the HTTP client just to kind of add some functionality to that. Like, for example, sending authorization headers. I noticed in some code bases, people extend from HTTP client for some reason and uh, add uh, some, for example, cookie service that would get the token or something. We kind of add the logic in between. But really, Angular provides us with interceptors. We don't need to extend anything. We can write separate interceptors in a beautiful way. Just put them together. They will. Uh, add functionality incrementally during HTTP calls. So it's an, and it's, and this is also an easy thing to do because usually you're just creating new interceptors. It it isn't going to break anything. Usually we we'll just just change the place where the logic is working. And of course, if you're not using state management, uh, I personally think if you're using Angular, definitely should use state management because if your application is large enough that you're using Angular. Uh, and most probably you have lots of data to deal with it and lots of like interconnected uh, pieces of component and stuff. So it would benefit from, I usually suggest NGRX, but I'm an NGRX contributor and a big fan. So I don't insist on using NGRX. You can use NGXS. It's a perfectly good library. You can use uh, Akita, I believe uh, was the name. Uh, it's uh, Akita, for example, is more OP in the approach. Uh, also, there is the new addition of uh, NGRX Component Store, which foregoes everything from Redux. It, it doesn't use Redux at all. Redux approaches, you don't have actions and reducers. Instead, you have something like a very neat service with the subject, but you can also write selectors inside it, and you can plug different pieces of those states in different components. So it, for newcomers, NGRX Component Store is way easier than uh, the conventional NGRX store definitely look into that if you want to. Uh, and and the the good thing about it that component store can be added incremental. Like you can take one or two components that have connected data, create one uh, store for just those two components, put the data there, and after that you can start like collecting different store classes together. And it's a more OP approach if you are. A fan of that. I am not. I like functional programming more, but again, that's, that's only an opinion. If you like OOP more, you can go for uh, NGXS or NGRX Component Store in just, instead of NGRX Store. But uh, it will definitely provide improvement to your code base. So that is something to consider if you are going for larger refactoring of the architecture. Cool. cool. Thanks, so Armin. Yeah, you. you you actually gave us a, a deeper run through than I'd ever anticipated, but it was awesome. So I, oh, I'm wondering if we could insert a little applause there because that, that was out of the hat. Um, so, so well done, Armin.
Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks a lot. I, I, I hope you uh, come again soon because I, I want you to, to do a proper presentation for us. Yeah, okay. sure. I'll do cool. it. Right. Uh, do, do you mind if I uh, sort of change tracks a little bit and start sure. presenting again? Is that okay? Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to um, resize this window over there. Lovely. And I'm, then I'm going to start sharing again. Uh, here we go. And oh, yeah, I'm going to use a window today. And this fellow. There we go. So, and we're on. Okay. So, um, thanks, Armin, again. Uh, that, that, that was sort of at the top of my list. And that's certainly uh, what I uh, sort of look to first. I, I go and use your. Um, article as a, as a reference to sort of trigger my memory about what I should be uh, refactoring. Uh, I suppose the, the one piece that I would add to that is about the container presenter pattern. Um, and this is, again, this is just my opinion. <laughs> so, so here we go here. There's a link to um, an excellent article here on, on the container presenter pattern. And I'll just click on, on that so that we can see it. It's from Angular University and goes deeply into the container presenter okay um and i'll i'll just get back to this page um i uh it sort of relates to what you were saying armin about uh fixing the rxjs chains um i i i find that sorting out things into container presenter means that i can focus on the local state for a given feature and the way it ties into the global state maybe where you're using NGRX. Um, and again, the local state is the prime candidate for using NGRX component store. I've, I've done that a few times. Um, and I, yeah, I have mixed, mixed feelings about that, not because it isn't elegant, because it's awesome. But I, I found that um, other developers get tied in knots with it. So it's, it, it's, it's both beautiful and and a difficult one to maintain. Anyway, moving on. Uh, so container presenter pattern, a couple of points below it um, that, that sort of relate to the same thing. I, I tend to look for classes that could become services. Um, and they're usually the things that form the basis of the local state for the container presenter pattern for the, the actual containers. Um, and within those, I look for a data module data models that are overgrown and become fragmented so so they've got like way too many properties that are doing uh, sort of boolean things that that could otherwise sort of be grouped together into just as one place and it just means that you use that thing in multiple places but but hopefully without creating work um it's it's all a sort of fine judgment thing and the final thing that i try to do is uh, add a few unit tests um, opinion wise, I, I think that if you've got your business logic and your calculations covered, then you've got that sort of 80 20 rule of, of the things that are most likely to break in your application. So when I say business logic, I'm talking about uh, nested if statements, basically, the places where you make choices about which way to go and what things you're doing and what kind of data to show. Um, and and that, that's the places where I like to focus as many unit tests as possible. Um, I've got a sort of point in yellow. Do you have any suggestions? I'm going to throw it open just right now. I haven't finished this presentation, but I'm, I'm feeling that a lot of us have something to say at this point, and it's, it's, it's the right time. And I'm going to um, ask on our friend Rod, Rob Ramirez uh, to, to speak his mind. <laughs> no. No, I just want to say you were saying about the if statement, and I think that uh, we use a lot of uh, if statements that we shouldn't be using. Like, for instance, when we want to say that if this happens, I want this variable to equal this uh, other, uh, you know, value. Instead of doing that, why don't you just declare the variable equals and then do a, what do you call it, a, a short if statement, which is, you know, like, with the uh, question mark and the uh, uh, colon, yeah, a right? ternary, yeah, a ternary operator, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. So it's that works best because that way 
it also gives you a, a more readable code because it, you're right. you don't have to you don't have to go through the if statements to say oh then this changes to this why but why you know you are declaring the variable and you are also you know uh, declaring the value at the at the same time so it's, that's one it's, thing it's an excellent point but one thing to be careful of is not to mm -hmm. nest too deeply too in many. your ternary operators because yes. that can be ternary hell Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. The other uh, option to an if statement is also have an array of values. So basically, if you want to say, uh, for instance, um, I have three colors and I want to know if it's blue, red or green. And I have different uh, things that are going to happen in those different ones. Instead of saying, uh, you know, if it's green, right, I could just say if it's uh, index of the array and it's green in there, then it's one of the values that I'm going to be using. So, you know what I'm saying? Instead of saying uh, if an if statement that has an and clause, so basically Absolutely. if it's green, if it's red, if it's blue, you know, then you can consolidate it into an array and just uh, get the values from there automatically. Excellent. So you're talking about sort of consolidating uh, uh, ifs, if you like, in, into... Correct into a sort of lookup. Yeah, that makes right. a lot of sense. Yes. Have you got any more for us, uh, Rob? Have you got any uh, refactor targets apart from sort of ifs? Um, I have seen uh, a lot of in Angular that people are using a lot of, uh, creating a lot of uh, HTML unnecessarily when they can use an ng, uh, ng4 uh, to do the same thing as directive. So, uh, I think that will be uh, one thing when we're refactoring, try to look up for those uh, little uh, items. Because you might think, oh, it's just HTML and just repeating and just changing things around here and there. But, you know, someone coming new into the code is not going to think that way. They're going to be like, well, why do I have to change this here and I have to change it again over there? Might as well just change it, do an NG4 and they just change it one time. And... You can always create an array to look through uh, different values, uh, you know, for your HTML. Spot on. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big sort of fan of trying to reduce uh, markup. So trying to come up with the simplest way to express uh, a, a template and to use subcomponents to reduce the, the, the actual markup. Yes, yes. And uh, the last thing is uh, unit testing. Uh, I think unit testing is the easiest way for you to refactor your code. Because as soon as you create that test and you're like looking at your code and the test doesn't pass, you're going to figure a way to refactor that code so that the test passes. So you are, you know, you're golden right there because you're going to be able to uh, refactor with ease uh, in a way because... Uh, when you're doing a test, it's like you having a helping hand uh, guiding you to what should the code uh, evaluate to. So the end result, basically. Excellent. I'm, I'm going to hand over to Armin. He's got his hand up. Thanks. Uh, when you mentioned the container presenter pattern, I remember the very interesting uh, technique sort of that I learned uh, on one of our uh, Angular Adventures in Angular podcast from Thomas Tryon, and it was uh, very interesting. If you don't mind, I will uh, share my screen for a bit. Yes, please. Because Go for it. I have uh, in in this code that I've been showing, uh, the the fun thing is that when I was writing this application, I didn't know better. So now we have the sort of bad code. <laughs> that I can show how we can refactor this with a container presenter pattern. So this, this doesn't follow the container presenter pattern and it uses stuff from the store. So those are observables, right? Uh, and the template is a bit messed up because I use uh, async pipe a lot here. So I have async pipe here and here and here and here and so on and so on and so on. But what can I do if I use the container presenter pattern. It's a very beautiful approach because what I can do is I can combine these selectors uh, in NGRX, uh, or if I don't use NGRX and, and I just have observables, I can use combine latest or something. So I can combine this 
all of this code, let's imagine this code doesn't exist. And I can have one single view model observable. Oh, sorry, I'm writing in Russian. <laughs> uh, imagine that I have this thing, but yeah, sort of like an article detail uh, selector, but let's imagine I have a name selector that combines uh, the article details view model, something like this. Let's imagine we have that. And if I'm using the container presenter pattern, instead of all of this code, I can write one ng container, for example. And here I will put ng if, let's say, pm async as pm. So now I have a presenter component for this, and I will have to just pass the data that I already have. Enter, for example, right? So now I will just have to use everything from this VM object. So because of type inference and the awesome way that NGRX selectors work, this is type safe. So I definitely know what object this is. I won't have the problems with ng if. So we have this nasty problem with ng if, if, if I'm selecting uh, something from the store that is a Boolean value. If, it, if it's false, then my ng if async as something will not work, right? This will not work because it will work, it will return a false value, and it will not render anything. But I don't have this problem because I always have an object here. I have a VM object. And then I will just pass the data. Yeah, like for example, article list. Let's imagine we have something like that. Oh, again, that article list, and so on. And then in this presenter component, I won't have to deal with any observables. I just have inputs that I can take and use. And I only wrote one single async pipe and it dealt with all of the observables. And even more so, if I have side effects, if I, for example, some values from here, for example, need to be patched on an Angular form. Imagine we have an, a form inside this component that is dependent on this data. I can just use the tap operator here, right? Uh, and do all the side effects here, for example, something that Copilot suggests for me just for as an example, or I have a form I can do this with form. Sorry, patch value something vm dot article for example. Uh, I will have one tab statement. I will have one observable here, and I will just have one async pipe, but it will work the same way, and my code will be very clean here. Other than this, I will just probably have. Um, Methods that just, for example, dispatch on directions or do very little logic and then dispatch actions. So container presenter pattern is very good, especially if you are using RxJS heavily. That was generally the approach that I uh, like to take. Excellent, Armin. Uh, do you mind if I uh, inter interject um, and sure. I'll ask Danny to uh, pipe up because he's uh, posting comments about container presenter and probably has something that relates to what you're saying. Yeah. Well, well, I just wanted to, I, I posted that article with uh, Lars Gure, which is uh, really, really good. It, it's a bit complicated, but uh, I adopted this pattern that he explains, um, I think a couple of years ago, and it's helped me immensely to not have a <laughs> too confusing code. And just to have things in my mind work well as well, so I understand where is my business logic and where is my my uh, my presentation um, component. So it, it it helps really really well to have a a pattern for that. I feel in in Angular, and then uh, the uh, the view model dollar pattern is great as well. I posted an article with Deborah Curato where she explains it very well. But actually, it was a bit different, Tom. If you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> The topic I raised my hand for. Bring it on. Let's have it. Well, I I recently I'm I'm pretty new to doing unit tests, and I uh, I read the latest book with Robert C. Martin, Uncle Bob, called 
clean craftsmanship, where he talks about us being developers, but really being craftsmen, you know, that we should really um, think about it as an kind of an art form, what we do, and also the impact it has down the line and all of that, of, of course, we, I think all of us understands here. But when I, I read that book and saw some of the examples, I couldn't help myself to start doing some of the unit testing, which was really, really helpful. And uh, I do have projects where I can't do unit testing, but the pattern of doing unit tests and then refactoring all the time, it, it kind of made me realize that the, what he talks about as well, the constant refactoring you shouldn't be afraid of. So I started even in projects where I can't do unit testing at the moment or, or, or the, the team is not into it, so I won't do it there. But, uh, but the pattern of, of allowing everyone to do constant refactors, I think is really, really, really good. <laughs> and I really felt it with myself to, because um, before I was a bit afraid of it and I was planning as a manager, I was, I was planning the refactor sprints and, um, I feel the other way is much better if everyone can feel comfortable doing constant refactors. I totally agree with you, Danny. Have you ever read much um, Michael Feathers? Um, he's got a book, Refactoring. Oh, is it? No, Working with Legacy Code. Mm. And he says the first step is to get your code into a test harness. And then you can do whatever you like with it. Brilliant. I'm going to take that step <laughs> with all the projects if I can. <laughs> cool. Um, I, uh, uh, I also, oh, I, I wrote a, an article uh, here. I posted an article. Yes, uh, Rob, uh, oh, sorry, you, we lost you there. Do you, do you wanna? No, I'm saying that I posted an article in Angular Nation for the, uh, for it, how I convinced my team to do uh, unit testing. Uh, I don't know if you read that, but... Uh, no, I haven't. Could you post a link here? Because sure. I'd welcome it, and I'm sure the others would. Yeah, post it. Excellent. And Armin, would you mind if I take back control, to use a, a popular phrase over in this continent, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, start um, sharing uh, my presentation, if I may? Sure. So, um, so I'm just going to start sharing a window. Here we are. And there we go. Come on, do that, share. Right. Okay, off we go. So we've talked about refactor targets. Okay. Um, and now I'm going to move on to the, the next uh, topic before we sort of really open it up and just talk about anything to do with refactoring. The final piece that I want to talk about, and I'm hoping you'll chime in, is renaming Angular components. Okay. Could it be easier? Well, I, I think it could. But before I talk about that, um, here's the steps. Okay. It's on a timeline that I've sort of roughly estimated how long it takes to rename an Angular component. Um, do, can anyone do it faster than that? Okay, I'm taking that as um, no, <laughs> which I'm, I'm a little um, surprised at because I, I thought there might be some quick clickers who could do it or maybe had it scripted or something like that. But basically, here's the steps. First of all, you have to rename the symbol and I'm talking about doing this in VS Code. Uh, you uh, do an F2 on the class name and then save all the files it edits. Then you rename the files and folders. It's a manual step, but the imports are auto updated by VS Code these days. There is an extension that Anna posted into the chat about uh, what was it called? The, um, the uh, oh, I've lost my plot here, Anna. Uh, do you want to speak? You you can you can. Yeah, um, me too. Sorry, I I'm looking through my extensions too. I think I lost it. It's uh, called Move TS. Yes, Move TS. So so there was a time when VS Code didn't do it for you, and um, uh, Move TS does. Now I'm I'm going to talk about that shortly, but I'll come to that point. Um, 
then you need to confirm your imports have updated. If you've accidentally left any editors open, um, they won't uh, update or they won't save properly. Um, then you need to rename the selector. This is kind of optional. Um, and the article reference below at the bottom doesn't actually do it. But um, if you've used the CLI to create a component, it auto creates a selector for you that uses the same naming convention based on the style guide. And um, I like to think that it's part of uh, renaming an Angular component that you rename the selector so that it falls in line with that, that uh, naming prefix on the component. Okay, so could it be easier? Well, I think it could. Here's an, a VS Code extension that I've just written that, that's actually based on um, Anna's uh, extension, move TS. I've used it as a library to do the indexing for me. Okay. Um, I'm gonna, gonna click on the link and um, there you are. You can download it, All right? Anyway. Um, uh, oh, well, thank you, Romek. I appreciate the silent clap. That's, that's very nice of you, okay? Um, I'm going to, uh, let's see if I can come out of the uh, full screen, come back to this. So you'll find the link to the extension there. Um, I might bother to paste the, uh, I, I can, I, I've got to do it. Because um, it's, um, um, what, what's the word for it? It's self-advertising anyway. So I'm going to paste it directly into the chat so you guys have got it. All right. Um, is it in there? Yeah. There we go. Right. Um, uh, yeah. Like I say, it's it's based on Move.js, but it's got a lot more uh, code in there. Um, what, what I'd like to do is do a little demo for you, if that's OK. OK. Um, I'm going to go and open uh my recent one there okay so here's an angular project i'm going to close down that tab because i don't want to see it here we go so um i'll get rid of that folder just for fun here we go so i've got a component called book list okay it's it was created with the angular cli so the folder matches the same naming convention and all four files are named with the same prefix and it's only their postfix that changes just just like any cli base component and you'll see that the prefix is very default as well i can right click on any one of these files i'm going to choose the uh, sas file just to prove a point here's the extension now rename the component okay um, i'm going to call it table component because i know that works okay well, i think you're on the wrong screen yep. <laughs> oh sorry i think can you're you? on the wrong screen ah oh i'm i'm do apologize Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you caught me out. OK, I'm going to undo that. And that's it. That's a bit silly. Right. OK, let's try again. Present a window. Let's have a look. So share. Right. My apologies. Right. Can you see my code now? Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes. Let, let's try it again. So. Here's, here's my book list component. I can right click on any one of the four files. Here's the extension kicking in. I click rename component, type in the new new name of my component. I, you'll notice I don't have to put the dot component because if you were on the CLI, you wouldn't have to either. Okay, just enter. There you go. Boom, it's done. Renamed. If I go, you'll, you'll see a sort of output of the files that have been edited and down here, at the top, if I just stage my changes so that you can see all the changes merged, um, if I click on the table component, you'll see that it was originally called book list. It's changed the selector, template URL, style URL, class name, all in one hit. It's updated the module imports and exports. And most importantly, it's updated the selector in all of the template files that were affected. OK. And coming back to, um, I'm, I'm going to have to st stop presenting that one and present back to my uh, uh, um, tab. Yes, let's let's go back to the tab. There, share. Okay. 
So, um, yes, uh, coming back to here, right. So um, rather than the timeline of roughly about five minutes, I um, hope you saw that, it was, it was less than 10 seconds. So I'm hoping you guys might give that a little whirl, all right, um, and save yourself some time. And now, finally, it's over to you. All right, what do you think about refactoring? And um, are you gonna use my new extension? <laughs> I'm gonna stop sharing the screen now and hand it over to, the, to everybody. You feel free to either unmute, put up your hand, or just start speaking, it's all good. I'm just going to start speaking then. Good man. <laughs> it looks uh, brilliant, Tom. Really, really good. I was just trying because a WebStorm has something as well built in, but it doesn't do the selectors. So this is even better. This is really, really good. Thank Thanks you, for doing that. I love the extension because I, uh, we kind of have a team of seven front-end developers. It's a fairly large projects so every time i i go around saying like you know we need to rename this this and this and it's like oh man don't don't, don't get started on that again doesn't matter we we don't want to spend time on that but i guess with this extension it will be way easier to convince people to rename stuff that that's my hope and particularly when you're migrating to container presenter pattern you'll find that there are subcomponents that loosely relate to uh, your subcomponents as you want to have them, but they need a rename because they're not doing what they say on the tin. Um, and now you can in a couple of seconds. Okay. That was a bit conceited, but I couldn't help myself. Sorry about that. So more importantly, um, Guys, uh, do, do you have trouble convincing your stakeholders to do refactors? I reckon Armand does, because he seems to have an arsenal of, of, of uh, strategies. Uh, um, do, do any of you uh, others have, have the same sort of troubles? I'm just getting nods. Yes. You can un unmute. <laughs> Hello, Danny. Hi. Yes. Okay. And, and actually, uh, uh... The worst case scenario is when is when like the clients or stakeholders really say, "Oh, we would love to have refactoring. We would love to have better quality code." But you know, oh, you are working on something like that. Oh, brush that away. We have some priority right now. So you kind of it's very dangerous starting doing anything larger than one or two days because. Uh, there is always something urgent on a on a big project. There's always, especially if if they have their own stakeholders uh, and who depend on the project, who request new features and stuff. So, uh, in that in, in that sense, I, I kind of like like outsourced projects more uh, than than developing your own product. But only in that sense, like it's more challenging because of all the hassle you have to go through to get stuff approved. Um, but it's an interesting challenge because it it kind of provides you some insight into your code of what is really important. Because sometimes if you are a developer, you you love to code, especially if you if you are like one or two years into development you enjoy creating things and, and you still do after that too. But usually when you're more experienced, you actually start liking like the code itself. Sometimes you might not even care what it does. It's just, it's beautiful. It's over. It's very uh, like intelligent code. I love it. It's so beautiful, but what the hell? I don't know what it does. But, but you're you're it really so right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just so, going to look awesome. It doesn't actually, it yeah. doesn't matter that it's only, uh, you know. So sometimes um, when you're really deep in that, you forget that the first purpose of the code that you're writing is to be a product that is delivered and that users uh, actually use and benefit from. So uh, I, having to deal with all of that is kind of refreshing. <laughs> I think, I think actually, we, we probably, you and I, because we're both laughing at that joke, uh, we probably need to be quiet about that in front of our, our clients or stakeholders because, because they, they will interpret that as, as us wanting to gold plate the code, um, uh, which is a popular phrase I've come across. Um, but actually, 
the, the fact is that as a developer, I am happy seeing things as sort of 80% perfect. Um, I, I don't need to go above that. Um, if I get to that level, I feel awesome. Um, and most projects never get quite that far. <laughs> Isn't it also about self-realization? You know, when you look at your old code, you realize what was I doing here? I mean, because all of the new things you've learned since. So, you know, if you've done that enough, then you realize that your code will never be perfect. Because if you look at it in two months, you're going to think I could have done better. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's yeah. just a constant journey. You're always refining the thing that you've, you, you, you know you could have done better. Yeah. Uh, so all of the application that I was showing when I was writing that, it was, I believe, 2019, I guess, or start of 2020. I was thinking, oh, this is the pinnacle of what I am doing. This is the best thing. I, I did it from scratch and you know I'm looking back, well, man, I'm not even using Container Presenter. Oh, you know, it's not a large application. I don't need Container Presenter, but deep down i think oh maybe i can improve this or something something so i really like what danny says here about uh you know it's a continuous process it's uh it's good to be to feel like perfectionist about it but you have to remember that it, it's not like it's not like lord of the rings when you will you know destroy the ring and and after that yeah everything is cool you will always have to kind of uh, go back you will always have technical debt you will always have uh, sometimes you, there is a new feature you are developing there is a big deadline it's very important so you kind of brush away like your good code you're just oh this is this works it doesn't have bugs so we're gonna ship it but we have technical debt we're gonna come back to this and refactor absolutely we have to triage yeah, yeah. it's kind of um i see we've got a couple of hands up um i'm gonna i think uh giant Went, went first, but then I, I hope I'm not, not wrong there, but then we'll call for awesome if that's okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I was just uh, wanting to get your opinion uh, on the saying that we have uh, into the software engineering world that um, if a particular piece of code is working, don't touch it. So uh, what do you guys think about that? <laughs> Because in the process of refactoring things, uh, you might end up, um, you know, rewiring some things, and you might end up missing some things. So, and that can come on to you. So, what do you think about that? If if I may, I, I'll, I'll take an opinion on that nice and quickly. I think if you can encapsulate the code, and nobody's going to touch it again, then that's a valid opinion. Okay, but if you can't encapsulate it, I'm afraid that's not really a good idea. So if it's not readable, right? <laughs> if somebody else ever is going to read it and it's not readable, you should basically refactor it. Is that what you're saying, Tom? No, no, I'm, I'm not saying tidying for tidying's sake. I'm saying if you can wrap it in a name, in a, it's sort of in, in an object, usually a component or a service, so that you can name it and says, it does this job, okay? then it contain all manner of naughtiness inside as long as that doesn't leak, okay? As long as that's just in one place, you can put comments around it and say, oops, sorry, you know? Um, but but the, the main thing is to just make sure that that doesn't damage the rest of the application. As long as you can wrap it that way, um, then and nobody needs to edit it, it's fine. Very good perspective. Yeah, makes sense. I realized I was muted. I, I want to say that I agree with Tom a lot here because uh, we also had this experience where I like, have several different applications uh, for the same project and we have some shared code and we have so we have a library on a private NPM repository. So in that library, I usually find myself uh, giving more leeway to the developers like yeah, okay, this component doesn't really look nice, but it works and it's very well encapsulated. So yeah, we kind of, someday we might refactor it, but for now it's okay because actually no one is seeing that and, and it's a very uh, rigid piece of code. It's, it's not too complicated. It's not tidy, but it's okay to have it there because as Tom said, it's encapsulated. Uh, you just use it. So... 
uh, the the more interconnected parts of the code need refactoring way more than something like that. Absolutely. Uh, is it all right to hand over to Orson? Because he's he's politely waited for us to come to a pause. Hi, Orson. Do you want to unmute? Yeah, I'm here. So actually, I, today I was trying to refactor an, an Angular application. And um, because I realized that the vendor um, bundle was, uh, JS file was just too large. And um, I didn't even have any other dependencies like Lodash or anything like that. And it was, to me, in my opinion, it was large because I was trying the Lighthouse, I was um, running the application through the Lighthouse um, Chrome plugin and it was giving me this red red flag. And I was just wondering what are, what other things could someone do to reduce the vendor? Because I know clearly I don't have any of those, any external dependencies. I don't, I didn't install any of those things. So, and I'm just wondering why it's that large. It isn't too large, but for my liking anyway, because it's slowing down the application on on mobile. Okay, so so how 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 big is the 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 download on that particular module? Um, the the mod, the vendor mode is about almost one point something meg. Yeah, one thousand something kilobytes. Yeah, that's reasonably large. So yes. Um, yeah, it's a bit tricky, isn't it? Uh, are you are you using all of that vendor stuff at the the beginning of the application? You know, like the first page you load, do you need to use all of that? Because I'm I'm wondering if you can sort of um, uh, treat that as as sort of like separate uh, vendor dependencies. Um, uh, I'm not sure if this relates, but but in your Angular JSON, you know, you have a a scripts. Um, uh, node and you can specify um, your outer dependencies though not strictly if they're they're tied into the framework but if they're sort of outside dependencies you can uh, specify the the name of the bundle that they'll go into and then you can load them that way uh, that might come in handy but if they're directly tied into the angular framework then then maybe that's a different question yeah, right. they are tied into the Angular framework because I didn't have any external dependencies at all. Got it. Okay. Thanks, Anna. That was a very nice compliment. Um, uh, Danny, I think you've got a com comment about this. Uh, I'd like to hear from you. Yeah, I was just thinking if you could use the, is it called Webpack Analyzer? To dive in okay. and see what's what's going on in the in the packages. Oh, Danny, you, you've you've triggered uh, a memory for me. Thank you. Okay. Sure. <laughs> um, something that I've noticed that, that developers frequently do because they find a Stack Overflow that, that tells them to do it, um, which is uh, with Angular Material, uh, they create a module that that instantiates all of the the module modules into one import. Okay, so they get all of the stuff that they could possibly need. And, and load it into um, uh, uh, from Angular Material and just load it in, and then possibly use pieces of it later. Now, the whole package of Angular Material is enormous, and I suspect that the the um, uh, competition uh, vendors for for the same sort of thing are also large for the same sort of uh, 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 things that they're trying to achieve. Like, you know, a, a grid component can be enormous. Okay. Um, so, uh, but, but it's frequent that in a, in an application, we don't use all of Angular materials features and they've purposely, um, made it export in individual, uh, scams or single component modules. And it's important to only import the ones that you use because otherwise you get bloat in your vendor package. And I, I'm wondering whether that would be a good target to, to look at as well. Thank you very much. 
anybody else got an opinion on Orson's um, experience about an over large vendor package? Okay, no. And uh, has anybody else got any points to make on uh, refactoring? Because we're sort of heading towards the end of our, our planned time. Oh, we've got a hand up from Lexia or Le Lex or Lexi. Can, it, can you refine my refactor how I'm pronouncing your name? Ah, it's it's <laughs> not my name. It's just Nick in my Google account. Okay, um, well, hello, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have uh, a question. Okay, uh, while we're working on uh, uh, refactoring, uh, we can uh, change uh, file uh, structure and uh, uh, our other team working on uh, same uh, files on main repo and uh, they apply some changes, yeah, but maybe fixes. And um, uh, when we try to merge our um, main repo to our uh, it's we have a lot of uh, conflicts and uh, and sometimes it's uh, pretty tricky to um, resolve all that con conflicts uh, uh, because of uh, like uh, working uh, on the same files and uh, um, it's what uh, be be best approach uh, to resolve uh, uh, that issue from your side. What, what you are doing uh, to avoid si such problems? Excellent question, Nick. I can actually help with that, but I'll, I'll open the floor. I, I've, I've got an opinion on that, but um, has anybody else got something to say about that? Because I don't want to steal um, all the words. No, we're quiet at the moment. Okay, so um, one of the, the key commands that you can use manually, okay, is uh, git move, git mv, um, and if you're just uh, renaming a file or changing its location, git mv will actually keep a track of that file, know where it was before, know where it's going to, and then if somebody el else edits it on the way, those changes apply, okay? That's one of the ways. Um, uh, but again, when, when a lot of edits are going on, uh, all bets are off, you know, it's, it's not always possible to keep track of. So I think that comes down to one of my other strategies, which is I, I try to keep my PRs really small. If I know I'm having a big effect somewhere, um, then, then I try to, uh, like, like, if I've got some moves and some edits to do, I will do all the moves first, or I will do a chunk of the moves um, to get that out of the way, get that through. Um, past the other developers so that they they can sort of uh, update from that um, as quickly as possible. Yeah, so, so keeping PRs both in flight for a short period of time and keeping the amount of work that you do quite small will reduce your, your conflicts, but Git move will help. And lately, um, Git uh, recognizes when you actually just delete a file and re it reappears in another place in the same commit, it treats that as a move and, um, and it merges those two. But if you do an edit uh, in between, um, it doesn't recognize that as a move. So, so, so that's something to be aware of and probably to rehearse as well. <laughs> because, um, yeah, it's, it's worth seeing uh, what, what goes on in your Git history. <laughs> so I hope that helps a little bit, Nick. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Any other thoughts, ideas, questions? Okay, I think we can round up. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you all here and, and it's been a really valuable discussion. And Armand's taught me a few things, not to mention Danny. And, and some of you others who, whose names I, I'm not remembering entirely. Um, thank you for all of your contributions. And um, please come again. I'm going to set up another meetup, hopefully in about six weeks or so. Um, uh, yep. And I hope as many of you can come along as possible. Um, yep. Thank you. And thank you, Danny. Um, and thank you, Yusa. Um, yes. Um, well, uh, I, 
with that, I think um, we'll, we'll pop off. Um, feel free to uh, sort of trail off at the end and if, if you fancy a sort of backroom chat. OK, um, but otherwise, I'll see you guys a bit later. OK. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for having us. Bye. Cheers. Thanks. Bye bye. Cheers. Thanks, Marvin. <laughs>